So you've probably heard that Kurzgesagt have answered critics about their funding, while they responded less to our viral video and more to a different creator, the hated one, in a Reddit post and later in a video. We decided to answer as well. Some of their criticisms relate to our video and even though we addressed them there, it was only in passing. So even though we're currently recording something else, details at the end, we decided to drop everything and spend these few days on this video. So, by the way of addressing Kurzgesagt, we're gonna talk a bit more about what it means to trust science. And since we're here, we'll also say a few words about a few of their videos released since, because they seem... concerning. We'll spare you the whole drama. Links in the description. If you didn't watch our video, you should still be mostly okay with this one. A TLDR version would be... In their two climate videos, Kurzgesagt push a particular political narrative called green growth, which focuses on economic growth as a primary method for caring for the climate, and suggest that it's the only viable solution to the climate crisis. In the real world, though, this approach is hotly debated. The main supporters are mainstream economists and billionaires, hint hint, while the opponents are climate environmental scientists and social scholars. So we have a very similar layout to forces that we had with climate denialism. Currently, the main opposition to green growth is so-called degrowth, an idea that economic growth as a solution is incredibly inefficient, and that we should reorient our economies on human well-being. We'll provide links to further explanation in the description at the end of this video. Speaking of, we'll split it into three parts, kind of reflecting Kurzgesagt's answer. First, their answer. Second, their history and ours, third, their goals and ours. And before we begin, a disclaimer. Yes, it's okay to enjoy Kurzgesagt. They have 174 videos, out of which we only have problems with perhaps a dozen. In almost all cases, they stick to natural sciences, and they are good at what they do. It's only when they stray into politics that things get hairy. And this is our major concern, with funding being secondary. Kurzgesagt responds to Kurzgesagt. That said, first they discuss numbers and say that Gates' funding only covers a fraction of what they've earned. And while the facts are true, their interpretation is less than honest. We've added up our earnings from 2015 through 2022. 62% of our revenue comes indirectly or directly from you. You watch our videos with ads, support us on Patreon or buy from our shop. The single biggest source of income by far is our shop, that alone accounted for 40% over the last eight years. YouTube ads accounted for 13% and Patreon 9%. So without your support, we would cease to exist. Then there are commercial sponsors advertising products. They accounted for 12% of our revenue. We also got about 7% from German public broadcasting for the German channel, but ended this partnership in 2022. Finally, there are institutional sponsors representing about 10%. Some people take issue with this, especially Bill Gates has come under public scrutiny and we've been criticized for even working with organizations funded by him. So let's look at this 10% in more detail. About 3% of our revenue over the last eight years came from the Gates organizations. This is a very similar argument that they've used in their text answer to both Bat and Panada and The Hated One that this money is a drop in a bucket for a company of 50. The thing is, they got their first Gates sponsorship in 2015, so all of the money they made later was in large part thanks to this donation. So it's kind of like when you read those stories of these young multi-millionaires that got there on their own. Well, with a small gift of their first million from their parents. But look, if you compare it to what they made over the next 10 years, that was only like 1%, so they're basically self-made men. This point was made by the hated one in his reply two months before this video went live. Oh, and don't worry, we're not gonna parrot his points. In fact, we only read it after we wrote the first draft of this video, in which we wanted to let this point slide. But the problem with this non-answer go deeper than facts being correct, but answer being less than true. We'll discuss that in the second part. First, our criticism. The one we made in passing. Of course, let's not fall into conspiracy thinking. It's not that Gates forced Kurzgesagt to write it. They have a whole article on how they accept sponsorships and that it is Kurzgesagt that need to have the final say on everything. They are not sponsored by Gates to make them agree with him. 
They are sponsored by Gates precisely because they already agree with him. But there's still one thing that Gates invests in. Well, two. It's probably no surprise that he invests strongly in Kurzgesagt. In 2015, he offered $570,000 for videos on health and vaccination. The climate videos are sponsored by other subsidiaries he controls. And the second one is Our World in Data, who cooperated with Kurzgesagt in creating these videos, and others. So we've got a happy media bubble of people patting their backs, sponsored by one of the richest people on the planet, and basically acting as an ad agency for him. And Kurzgesagt have this to say. Finally, there are institutional sponsors representing about 10%. Some people take issue with this, especially Bill Gates has come under public scrutiny, and we've been criticized for even working with organizations funded by him. So let's look at this 10% in more detail. About 3% of our revenue over the last eight years came from the Gates organizations for a wide variety of topics, often suggested by us. Notice how they say nothing about the reasons why they're criticized for working with Gates-founded organizations. It kind of opens the possibility of these critics just being some anti-science, anti-vaxxers. And the most non-answer comes at this point. The institutional sponsors we're working with align with our values. We have contracts with every grant giver or sponsor that bars them from editorial influence other than suggesting topic areas like global health or climate change. We agree on video topics together, but sponsors can neither influence details nor our conclusions. The final decision always remains with us. You see how it doesn't answer our criticism or many other similar ones. They are not sponsored by Gates to make them agree with him. They are sponsored by Gates precisely because they already agree with him. This is the deflection. Instead of addressing the issue of how the media landscape is being astroturfed by billionaire grants, they just said, well, if they wanted to make us into propagandists, they would force us to change our opinions. They've turned a complex, system-wide issue into a simple story. And they triumphantly said, look, this story is wrong. Brothers in Christ. This isn't how modern propaganda works anymore. This is not the 40s, and Kurzgesagt aren't one of the only few existing media outlets that Gates & Co. needs to control. It's completely the opposite. They're one of tens of thousands of voices that Gates & Co. can amplify, so that their message is heard that much more. And if they support many of them, it does make it seem like all these different media outlets, organizations, or think tanks agree on something. Just look at how organic this support is. To see how it works in practice, let's look at this part of their answer. 5% comes from open philanthropy and is only used for specific projects. With these funds, we've started Arabic, Hindi, Korean, Japanese, Portuguese and French channels, bringing more free science content to more people. Then there's a two-year funding for original TikTok content, which gives us freedom to explore and learn how to do short-form science communication. We'll talk a bit more about billionaire-funded open philanthropy and its ties to Gates in just a moment. But for now, let's just focus on the fact that this money allowed them to make six additional channels plus TikTok. Something that probably wouldn't be possible without billionaires backing. And something that increased their reach tremendously. So the criticism was that Gates uses money to influence the public opinion by strengthening select voices. But Kurzgesagt changed it into Gates trying to influence their opinion. Nice strawman, or strawbird, or whatever. And just as a comparison, as we've made our video in English about nine months ago, it went viral, amassing 1.1 million of views. That's 25 times as much as the Polish version. We've been asked multiple times to translate this video to Portuguese, German, Chinese or Russian, but we have no way of translating, recording, reviewing and editing that. But if we received a grant from, say, Degrowth Illuminati Localization Foundation, DILF for short, we would be able to shape the narrative in these countries ever so slightly, while none of our core values got compromised. The Illuminati ones, that is. But having said that, does a sponsorship really not affect their message? Sure, it aligns with their core values, but also, their research also comes from a Gates-funded organization. And it's hard to imagine them actively trying to upset the hand that feeds them, which can be seen in some really weird omissions. When we discussed Gates' book, we said, 
Yes, we read it as a part of our research, and it's more or less like these videos. Have good ideas, have glaring omissions, with some outlandish ideas sparkled on top. For example, one of his two solutions for food waste is smart bins, which scan what you chuck in them and display the carbon footprint. No, we're not doing a bit here, that's really what it says. It's also interesting how little attention he gives to trains in comparison with a new generation of jet biofuels? Oh right, Gates is also one of the owners of Signature Aviation, world's biggest provider of private jet infrastructure. With all that we've set up to now, it's almost superfluous to say that he invests a lot in meat alternatives, which are so often mentioned in these videos. To be clear, the book mentions trains once, when he says we need emissions-free steel. Their videos show it, but don't say anything about public transit, while often mentioning electric cars. Sorry, we're not going to buy that Germans, out of all people, don't care about trains. What, is the only kind of ban they are interested in suddenly the Autobahn? We apologize all our German viewers for this joke. It was really insensitive. As we know, it doesn't meet the criteria for German humor. For the sake of our international viewers, we will not expose them to any actual German humor. If you watched the videos and read the book, well, you can see that one is an ad for the other. Kurzgesagt suddenly turned a lot less Kurzgesagt tea and less careful about using sweeping political statements. Anyway, to sum up, they said what a lot of their critics already knew and accounted for, and at the same time, they ignored the actual concerns. Because it wasn't meant to be an answer to the critics, but a story for their fans. And since they're a big social media company, they know that mainstream success comes from appeasing your audience. And that means telling them the story they wanna hear. But, before you say Kurzgesagt bad, no, that's not it. They're simply doing what a, such a big media company needs to be doing. They're not a smallish channel like us, not a popular streamer like Hassan, or even a large passion project like Crash Course. An organization of this size has some unavoidable inertia, so if their video sounds corporate, that's because it is. That's neither a good nor a bad thing, just something you need to keep in mind with all mainstream media. With more possibilities come different limitations and different kinds of biases. Of course, smaller creators absolutely can be biased, just that the biases that get you 10k subs are different from those that give you 100k subs and different from those that give you 20 million subs. So this brings us to our second point. Stories. Their story. On shaping facts into stories. In a way, their video is not only an answer to criticisms, but also a story about how they like to tell stories. Kurzgesagt's foundation was laid when Philip, our founder, dropped out of high school as a teenager. Learning seemed daft and useless, and he wasn't interested in anything. Until a very special teacher at a school for dropouts grabbed him by the neck. The way she taught was different. She talked about connections and the big picture. She told a story. For the first time ever, Philip wanted to learn more without being forced. It was a key life experience. Kurzgesagt tries to recreate this experience for you. Nothing is boring if you tell a good story, and we try to tell these stories to spark excitement and make you want to go on and learn more. When we said that it's a message aimed at their audience, this is what we meant. If you just want to answer criticisms, you don't wrap them in a story about how great you are and, by extension, how great your audience is. That's why we called it a PR stunt. But okay, let's use their story as a cool point of departure. First, let's start with just this short quote. As a team and a company, we want to grow to give more people access to a science-based outlook on the world. Because the story of our channel is sort of similar, but it picks up where Kurzgesagt left off. Panes, the scriptwriter, was very much the type of person raised on Kurzgesagt content, this internet intellectual with no formal education about the world at large, but a huge curiosity about everything science. He'd probably agree that he has a science-based outlook on the world. Well, that curiosity didn't extend to politics because it was just so messy and irrational. Still, raised by skeptics, fed and nurtured by pro-science, atheist and rational blogs, he felt he understood it all. And then, 2014, 2015 and 2016 happened. 
We've had a war in a neighboring European country with the Russian annexation of Crimea and invasion of eastern Ukraine. Poland got a right-wing government with a right-wing president who rose on a wave of anti-refugee sentiment even though there were no refugees in here. UK got Brexit, the US got Trump. The world seemed to go wild and some skeptics as well. So, in his 30s, feeling that he was lacking something crucial, went to the university to study philosophy. Yeah, here at public universities you can get a regular degree with your classes cramped over weekends. An option for working people. You have to pay, but not that much. It took only a few days to shatter his fact-based Reddit internet skeptic science fanboy mindset. Few months in and he was already lost to his old world. And he saw this huge gap that seemed unbridgeable and that none of the internet content at the time was able to fill. The English-speaking YouTube eventually got some video essayists dealing with complex philosophical, social and political topics. Poland? Not so much. It was still an alt-right conspirational mess. So we teamed up and decided to do whatever little we can. Our sixth proper video, which was a first fully original script, and not just describing some position or concept, was called Stemlord Philosophy – Science Majors vs. Humanities Majors. Our 900 subscribers could enjoy the whooping 20 minutes where we explain how and why the people who build their whole persona around believing in science can often be so… conservative. At least when it comes to social issues. Short version, because there's also the scientific method for the humanities and social sciences, but it's very different than the one used by natural sciences. And explaining this has been the MG mission ever since, which is obviously something quite different from what the climate-focused T3 does. Kurzgesagt does a good job at keeping their stories to natural sciences. The research that they do is great. Especially considering that we're talking about a huge channel that releases 10-minute videos and could have easily went the way of a content farm. Unfortunately, when they stray away from natural sciences, but try to maintain the same methodology, it doesn't work. Well, I mean it does work on their fans, but it does them a disservice. In response to the billionaire propaganda video on Reddit, Kurzgesagt's founder said, Accusation 2. Kurzgesagt is working in an unscientific way and uses sources that are also founded by the grant givers. TLDR, we don't work unscientifically but diligently fact check our videos ourselves and work with scientists from around the world. We quoted this answer instead of the video because it states outright what is only an underlying assumption in the video. They are offering this as a simple dichotomy of good versus evil, science versus science deniers, fact-checking versus fake news, and truth versus lies. And that, when you stick with fact-checking, you're the good guys, because the only alternative is fake news. Right? This is exactly the kind of oversimplification that our video and our Polish channel was there to address. And this one assumes that fact-checking is synonymous with truth. But the whole point of that Stemlord video was that facts tell us nothing. That context makes facts tell things. And that we use the context to make the facts tell stories. Sure, the liars and propagandists don't fact check, but that's because their audience doesn't care about facts. So ignoring facts is simply a more efficient way to produce more propaganda. But you can still have an amazingly sourced and fact checked story that is still wrong or skewed. Just having your facts correct means nothing if your choice of facts is biased. As was the case in their videos with the carefully selected few countries reducing emissions or fossil fuel exporting Norway subsidizing electric cars. In philosophical language, fact checking is a necessary condition for telling a true story, but not a sufficient one. As an example, let's take like 15 seconds that made us create this answer to Kurzgesagt and this channel. Some argue that a move away from capitalism is the only solution to this mess. Others insist that markets should be even freer without any interventions like subsidies. And some suggest that we need what's referred to as degrowth and to cut back as a species overall. In the source document, they provide a quotation on how degrowth conflicts with growth which comes from a post on Degrowth Info. So, they've correctly backed up their claim that degrowth conflicts with growth. Oh, but they didn't present it as this claim. 
they presented it as explanation what degrowth is. And as we mentioned, there's a much better definition right on the main degrowth info page. So instead of saying cut back as a species overall, they could have said focus on well-being, not economic growth. Just three more syllables and a way better explanation. But we need to take context into account. The whole video focuses on how growth is good, so cutting back as a species doesn't sound like a value-neutral judgment. Well, that, and they show this coin going down a falling bar chart, makes this bird unhappy. So even though the fact that degrowth is at odds with economic growth is correct, the story is that degrowth will make us poorer and unhappy. Hi, this is Panen from the future, because just before finishing this video, we learned a new word. And there's actually a word for that. In 2007, researchers at Harvard University called in paltering, where a palter is something less than a lie. They define lie as having three key elements. First, coming from an intention to mislead. Second, being factually incorrect. And third, misleading listener to believe an untrue statement. A palter doesn't have the second component, so it only aims to mislead and produce a belief in untrue state of things, without telling an untrue statement. A mild example of palter is a person with a PhD making a restaurant reservation as Dr. So-and-so in order to create an impression that they are a rich medical practitioner, instead of a financially struggling academic. A solid one would be Bill Clinton claiming that he did not have sexual relations with Monica Lewinsky. The researchers point out that in some ways a palter is worse than a lie. It's morally easier to do and to defend, and more importantly, it's harder to prove. After all, a palterer can say that it's the listener's fault that they've been misled, because they've assumed something that the palterer didn't say. However, it was also a common assumption, which the palterer knew about and intentionally decided not to correct. Like, say, that the well-sourced sentence was a definition of degrowth, or that since 3% is not a lot of money, it could not have had a significant impact on a company. As you can see, these palters are different than the strawmen from before, because they don't misrepresent an opponent criticism. Okay, back to the past, which for you is the present. We'd like to point out one more thing about sources. They are for people to click on them. In theory. In practice, especially internet practice, they can be also used as a rhetorical device to show that wow, this thing is sourced, so it must be good. So just be wary of links, and be especially wary when someone mentions the number of sources without actually referring to what they say. Final problem with sourcing. While you can source facts, you can't really source reasoning. For example, in this explanation of degrowth, we could link a proper definition of degrowth, but we can't link to any source that proves that what Kurzgesagt did was an assumption, not a definition. So in a battle of citations, they'd get one point and we'd get zero. This is the same situation as with fact-checking. Sourcing is a necessary condition, at least if you're quoting some real-world data, but not a sufficient one. And of course, the reasoning could very well be rubbish. There's no way to check without actually thinking about it. Okay, let's leave stories for now and go return to science-based outlook on the world. In philosophy, there's a famous thesis called Hume's guillotine, or the is-ought problem. It says that there is no way to extrapolate what ought to be done from what is, not without adding some assumptions. In other words, you can't turn descriptive statements into prescriptive statements. Science only tells us what the world is, but it can't say anything about what we should do about it. But what if we replaced these assumptions with scientific method? What if we used empirical data and experiments to see what works? Surely we can trust science, right? Sure, as long as we're not gonna be scientific about it. Mission. The most effective way of changing nothing. Now we need to introduce a branch of ethics called effective altruism. It's a version of based on utilitarian ethics, which believe that good actions are those, the results of which generate the most happiness. You can contrast it with other branches of ethics, like deontology, which states that we should follow moral principles no matter what, or virtue ethics, which aim at perfecting one's personality. 
When introduced in 18th century, utilitarianism was a revolutionary, evidence-based, no-nonsense, quantifiable solution to ethical problems. It turned out to be an interesting perspective, but hardly the last word in this discussion. Luckily, we have effective altruism, so utilitarianism adjusted for the 21st century, a revolutionary, evidence-based, no-nonsense, quantifiable solution to ethical problems. Unlike moral intuitions, which are often murky, effective altruism allows us to predict which actions will cause the most good. For example, you could either volunteer in a homeless shelter for a few years, or spend these few years studying finance, getting a well-paid finance job, and donating a given percentage of your income to the same shelter. While the latter seems counterintuitive, we could develop a formula to see which option would be more beneficial. Thus, there's a way to experimentally prove what works and what doesn't. So, did we just solve ethics? Using science? Unfortunately, no. While we don't have the time to get into the details of the problems with effective altruism, recently Abigail Thorne did an amazing job, so we'd recommend watching her video if the following reasoning may seem too fast. We're talking about effective altruism because it's a movement popular with billionaires who want to find the most effective way of using their vast sums of money to do the most good. Probably the largest effective altruism organization is Open Philanthropy, the very same one that gave Kurzgesagt money to create channels in new languages, funded by another billionaire, Facebook co-founder Dustin Moskowitz. And while you might ask, hey, T3, do you really have a problem with billionaires giving away their wealth in the most effective manner possible? Are you ever satisfied? Is there anything at all that makes you happy? Oh boy. That's a lot of ground to cover, so we'll split this argument into three. First, the effectiveness of this altruism. Second, why it's supported by people like Gates. And third, what it means in the long term. Testing for effectiveness of given charitable action or donation sounds great. We no longer need to rely on these murky moral intuitions or the iffy left-right politics. We just model an action and its results see if they are effective in theory, then run a pilot program in the real world, and if it works, we can put it into practice and keep monitoring the results. If we try hard enough, we can replace assumptions with pure science and have a perfectly rational system. We'll have science-backed outlook on the world, if you will. But what about the is-ought problem and the assumptions that are needed to get from is to ought to be? Can we replace them with scientific method and experiment? Yes, but only if we put a black box there labeled science stuff and never look inside. You see, science and experiment is also based on some assumptions, one of which is that the rules governing the world are constant and independent of time and space. It's a fair assumption. Reality exists everywhere and all of the time isn't a controversial statement, so experiments don't really need to account for it. Sure, the laws may interact with each other, like the flow of time being affected by gravity, but they are still universal and unchanging. But this works only for natural sciences. If we try to apply this rule in the social world, the question would be, are the rules governing our society constant and independent of time and space? Obviously, no. Not only do societies change, they're composed of people who consciously react to the changes around them. The very fact that society learns something new about itself makes it change its attitude towards what it learned. How in the world could you model something that changes by even looking at itself? The simple answer is, you can't, so you don't. What was a rational assumption in natural sciences becomes a completely irrational assumption in measuring good in the society. We need to find the best way of changing society for the better, as long as it doesn't really change society. So we need to do the most good while changing as little as possible. After all, any change to the system is something that can't be predicted, so we can't measure its effectiveness. And that's the precise idea that Kurzgesagt uses in their climate videos. Since we can only know what we have, we can only do what we know. For example here. We also don't have the time to figure this out and do a lot of experiments. We must implement solutions now. In other words, if effective altruism existed in the 18th century, it would be focused on how every one of us could convince the monarchs to take the best decisions because democracy is untestable and potentially dangerous. And now for the second point. 
It's a small wonder why it's the favorite philosophy of the kings of today, the billionaires, including Bill Gates. After all, it places them on the top, as the people who can do the most good, and makes sure that the structures that put them there remain in place. And so effective altruism makes us work within the bounds of the system, thereby strengthening it. After all, we need to effectively make money in order to effectively alleviate some of the injustices. For example, by working your finance job, you can make property values go up, so it's harder for people to get a place to live. But then you donate the money for a homeless shelter to make the problem of homelessness less severe. You help the system on both ends. In an ironic, vicious cycle, you strengthen it in order to clean up the mess that it makes. But wait, there's more! You see, these billionaires don't just give out their money to the government or some grassroots organization or to each citizen to do with them as they please. No, they set up foundations to spend that money in the way that they themselves see fit. And while they might not make these decisions personally or force the managers to do something, they simply choose the people who align with their values. Do you see what kind of perfect scam it is? They're being lauded for being charitable, while what they actually do is they project their political influence onto the world. Why is Bill Gates regarded as one of the most important names in the field of public health? It's not that he's a doctor. He's simply a king who has a lot of money and is willing to help. But he's not giving away that money unconditionally for, say, the WHO to use as they see fit. But, based on his best knowledge, which comes from the fact that he's a king who has a lot of money. While money can certainly gain you an access to experts, it doesn't make you an expert in the field. Before progressing to the third point, the long-term perspective, we need to sidetrack for a bit, because Kurzgesagt say... On top of curiosity, we want to inspire long-term thinking and a positive, constructive outlook. Now, we need to discuss a radical version of effective altruism called long-termism. You see, in effective altruism, it doesn't matter whether the person you help is here or far away. In fact, if you live in the West, it would be most effective to earn as much money as possible and then give them to a charity operating in a much poorer country instead of giving it to a local one because, well, things are much more expensive over here. The same rule used with space applies to time as well. It's better to spend these few years studying finance instead of volunteering in a homeless shelter because after these few years you'll be able to help it more with your donations. Long-termism takes this idea and cranks it up to 10,000. That we have a moral responsibility of doing things that are the best for the future of humanity. Not like a 100 years from now, but a thousand, 10,000, a hundred thousand. When humanity will span the whole galaxy. And this is where theories, science fiction meets political present. You see, the money Kurzgesagt got from open philanthropy was for videos on topics relevant to effective altruism and improving humanity's long-run future. And they did make a video sponsored by William McCaskill, a prominent philosopher of long-termism on how our civilization probably won't collapse, but even if 99% of the people died, we'd still be able to recover as a species. There are 1 billion agricultural workers today, so even if the global population fell to just 80 million, it's virtually guaranteed that many survivors would know how to produce food. And also a video sponsored by Open Philanthropy on how you can feel amazed that while things may seem scary now, humanity is very likely at the beginning of its journey. Humans will never leave Earth. Let's be conservative and assume that humans will survive for a million years which leaves us 800,000 more years to dawdle away. Assuming a stable birth rate of 125 million people each year, this means there are roughly 100 trillion humans waiting to be born. 850 times greater than the number of people that have ever lived. This would make everybody alive today only 0.008% of all people that will ever live. Think about where this leaves you then our future numbers rise to 1.2 quadrillion people that have yet to be born. And even this seems far from our potential. As the sun slowly gets hotter and brighter, Earth will remain habitable for about 500 million years. Humans will leave Earth. An interconnected civilization spanning the solar system would create the basis of existence for an absurd number of individuals, orders of magnitude more than if we stick to Earth, 
Even if we only existed for a few million years, people leave the solar system. If future people can colonize, say, 100 billion stars and live there for 10 billion years, with each generating 100 million births per year, then we can expect something like a hundred octillion lives to be lived in the future. This is a one with 29 zeros, a hundred thousand trillion trillion. We can spin this up as much as we like. If we divide the total energy available in a galaxy by the average energy needs of a single person, then we get a tridecillion potential lives. A million trillion 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 potential people. But even then, when we hear things like this, being optimistic about the future of humanity is not mainstream, and we think this is horrible. Pessimism often sounds smart and gets more views, while optimism can sound naive. But this is a bias that's not helpful for us as a species. We get an uneasy feeling, because according to their videos on climate change, we're going to solve it. We just need a little more political will, some better consumer choices, and not really disturbing the status quo. But even if we fail, then unless humanity dies out completely, there is still an amazing future ahead of us, as a species. And it's the species we should be concerned about. These quadrillions of people who are going to be born. And while we should do everything possible to maximize their number and their happiness, we also need to manage the greatest risk of all, that the species die out. Compared to this long-term problem, some short-term problems aren't. We have a problem with this perspective. Yes, this cold approach to logical extremes or absolute numbers in terms of humanity is something that you can hear often in philosophy class, but it is happening in a class setting and as a part of a conversation, not as, well, not as an ad for this way of thinking paid by billionaires. So let's do something that would also be done in a classroom and try to imagine an effective altruist and long-termist message to people who are just experiencing the Second World War. This next part might be a little depressing, so feel free to skip to the timestamp shown now on the screen. First, would using your time and resources to smuggle singular Jewish people out of Germany be actually effective? Would it save the greatest possible number of lives? Clearly, a person is a person, so a life of Jewish civilian isn't worth more than a Greek conscript. So shouldn't we stop the war where it's fought before it expands into? Well, one exception would be if that Jewish individual was wealthy and somehow his wealth wasn't confiscated. Then you should help such a person, or at least get the money out, which then could be used for the war effort or buying medicine for refugee camps. You could also point to the future and say that while things may look scary and apocalyptic now, the total number of victims is predicted to be no more than 2 or 3% of the world population. Needless to say, every loss is a tragedy that could have been avoided, but even the darkest scenario comes down to 3 times less people lost than in the Black Death. So you can take solace in the fact that humanity as a species will survive. And while all this new technology is used for destruction, who knows what we might do with it in the future? We can very well imagine the new kind of Roaring Twenties, the Twenty Twenties, when the roar of a rocket engine will not be a sign to hide in a bomb shelter, but a promise of humans going beyond Earth, to the Moon, or perhaps even to Mars. Hello, I'm Elon Musk. Die! What the... Elon Musk is possibly the greatest living inventor! Some might think we're trying to smear effective altruism by showing how inhuman an attempt at it could be. But this inhumanity isn't a side effect. It's a core and intended feature. We've simply applied it to a situation that, for many people, is still synonymous with clear moral good and moral evil which is also a common method used in the philosophy classroom. While real-world examples can't disprove a philosophical stance, they can make us think about it better. The very same thing that makes it seem inhuman in this example is what makes it so apparently revolutionary or insightful or counterintuitive, removing the fallible human component of ethics. We've just put it in a very human situation to see what happens. And now, a personal note from Panes. I mean, it's still gonna be me, Panen, reading it. You see, 
I've been struggling with these five minutes for the past like 16 hours, including in my sleep. Because I was trying to make it appeal to myself from way back when, who'd find this philosophy appealing and uplifting. Precisely because it removed the human component and made me a part of something greater. We want to inspire you to dream a little about the glorious future that we could actually build, but only if we believe it's possible. But I was simply afraid of what it means to be human, with its challenges, personal, social and interpersonal, of the mess that was politics and humanities. And if I could send a message to myself from way back then, or to similar folks listening right now, it would be this. Being human is all about connections, and the most important ones are the ones right now. You can't allow them to be overshadowed by your connection to some hypothetical people from 10,000 AD. Because it's true, you are living in a pivotal time in human history, and it's up to you to own it. Not for the sake of these perfect people in 10,000 AD, but for real imperfect people living today. For this generation and the next one. Because if you don't do it, don't take action, network, protest, organize a community, hack around with technology, you're gonna be like one of these images with a thin emaciated figure huddling in the corner of a cold, empty room with a VR headset on, dreaming of a long-term future. Okay, let's end the message here. If we've been a bit harsh with Kurzgesagt, Please remember that it's only about the select few political videos, especially those that don't say they're political. Because you've got to wonder just why this philosophy being advertised here by the ultra-wealthy. We already know that the answer is protecting the status quo, and that it's protecting it from the idea of climate justice, or the idea that countries should be responsible for their historical emissions, the lion's share of which is caused by the rich countries and that support should be proportional to the scale of the effects of the climate crisis, the lion's share of which is falling on the poorer, warmer countries. Sure, the inhuman element of effective altruism can sometimes be surprisingly benevolent, like when it tells us to save a hundred lives in a place we've never seen, rather than one person from our town. But it also has a darker side. If we can only save one of two people, then we should save the one that can do the most good. So, all the other things being equal, the one that's richer, or more skilled, or younger. And if, theoretically of course, we could save either Europe or Africa, shouldn't we choose the one that has more capacities to do good? No, no, of course, my friend, I'm not saying that. It's just a small thought exercise. We'll never have to choose between continents. But, since we've decided on the previous matter, it would only be prudent to think, while helping Africa or other places of course, what is the acceptable level of risk for Europe? Obviously, for the greater good of humanity as a species. We're not talking about primitive ideologies, like racism or fascism. We don't sort people by race, ideology, sexual orientation or whatever other irrational criterion. We'd just like to ask, what is the greater good for all of us? If it ever turned out that we don't have any other choice than to sacrifice some people, shouldn't we prioritize those most efficient? And shouldn't this rule also apply to countries or continents? Oh, please don't give me that. This has nothing to do with any kind of supremacism. It's just a simple, reasonable calculation which one is the greater good. The greater good. Yes, those countries most efficient currently are majority white, but that's just because of evils of history. Evils that we'll be able to eradicate in the future. We are actively using billionaire money to reduce these inequalities. So, can't you see that it's the countries with billionaires and innovators which need to be especially protected? Not because they are in any way better, it's just that they're able to provide the greater good. The greater good. In all seriousness though, yes, that should be concerning. When in our essay we discussed the irrationality of rationality, we mentioned Zygmunt Bauman's book on how the Holocaust was a perfect example of an irrational atrocity composed of steps that were, individually, rational. 
Despite how dark this may sound, we're pretty sure that we'll hear these kinds of voices even in this decade. And it's important to keep in mind that their inhumanity won't come from hateful extremism. It will be a result of a pragmatic calculation. And in this segment we've hopefully shown the limits of this pragmatism. That even though it seems scientific, calculated and emotionless, it's very political and based on the assumption that we really can't change anything. Conclusion The battle for long-term outlooks Some of these conclusions may seem disconnected. Like, it's not something that Kurzgesagt videos say. And that's true. However, we're interested in what these videos do and why they are the way they are. That's the role of social sciences or political philosophy. We want to help you think deeper about these issues, not just in terms of a simple story, especially not one with clear-cut good and bad guys. We want to make you ponder why and how did the channel change from straight popular science through world issues to something that is veiled politics. That's not something we'll get an answer to because 1. Kurzgesagt can't engage with content on this level and 2. It makes more PR sense to ignore what we brought up. The first argument was often repeated in the comments, that they're here just to spark curiosity and make people research stuff more in depth. That was true for their science video, but not so much for their political ones, where they provided a clearly biased answer that we don't have the time and that growth is good. Period. Oversimplifying problems just because they're introductory is fine, but for this exact reason, they should leave their answers much more open if they wanted to be honest. Speaking of PR, as one of our backers noticed on our Discord, this answer feels like just watching an ad for Kurzgesagt by Kurzgesagt. It's just a positive depiction of themselves without even acknowledging that there can be different political and philosophical views on what an optimistic long-term outlook means in practice. While we try to provide these alternatives, like in our videos on degrowth or solarpunk, there is an upside to the political undertones of Kurzgesagt. They are bland. These ideas need billionaire funding because, in themselves, they're an invitation to do nothing. Vote at the ballot and vote with your wallet isn't inspiring in itself and it only gets worse when you understand that it's being bankrolled by people whose wallets are many thousands if not millions times thicker than the average ones. People whom we revere for driving social change weren't really effective altruists and definitely weren't long-termists, because these aren't ideas that bind people together to face injustices and create a better world. They're just too corporate and sanitized of things that makes us human in the first place. People are social animals. We need connections, solidarity, a feeling of overcoming an obstacle together, and then having a party about it. The very things which working in finance or ensuring standards for TPS report cover sheets on grant applications simply aren't. You won't save the world by working a bullshit job, especially if that job is less about helping people and more about providing good PR to billionaires by showing just how much they donated and how many issues they addressed without addressing their underlying causes. Because when Kurzgesagt say We want to inspire you to dream a little about the glorious future that we could actually build, but only if we believe it's possible. It's not you who's going to take part in building it. Your role is just gonna be making the line go up. But hey, this time the line is green. The future is going to be shaped not by scientists or experts, but by billionaires, because you can't deny how effective they are. Okay, let's put a few conclusions so that whenever someone asks for a DLDR, you could give them a timestamp. While discussing his book, Winners Take All, The Elite Charade of Changing the World, which talks about the dangers of billionaire philanthropy, the journalist Anand Giri Daradas uses a wonderful phrase, that by making the process of social change more similar to running a startup or a business, the billionaire philanthropists change, change itself. And this is a very fitting conclusion and a new lens through which you can look at Kurzgesagt's climate videos. It was actually recommended by one of our backers way back when. Thanks, Dan.
And it's not about changing the opinions of creators, scientists or media outlets, but by boosting those whose opinions already agree with their wealthy donors, creating a pretense of organic backing. Another lens would be one of how the story of trusting science or fact-checking can be used to push narratives that are not quite true. A good example here would be the Kurzgesagt saying that from all the income over the last seven years, they only got 3% from the Gates Foundation, but also not admitting that it was given at a key time which allowed them to grow this much. It's not lying as much as omitting some context, which leads viewers to assume incorrect conclusions, which were very much intended. And the final lens is how effective altruism ties both of the above together by creating a false science framework which co-opts in the effects of well-meaning activists into a movement which, while doing a lot, ultimately can't change anything significant, because its very efficiency relies on being compliant with the system. Or at least, that's one way to think that through. Or three. Oh, shut it! Hey there, it's still me, Pan N. I'm gonna be real quick, just wanted to mention a few things before we end this episode. So, we're in the process of making another vid for T3 channel. Speaking of which, funny story, Pan S actually got stuck writing it, so he figured that he'll just split it into four parts, and the first one of them, about structuralism, is next in lineup. It's actually based on one of our Polish videos, but it needs to be redone in order to lay some solid groundwork for next parts, which will focus on degrowth. And hey, if you like what we're doing here, please consider tipping us at Kofi or PayPal, or becoming our sugar daddy or sugar mommy or glucose guardian at Patreon, like all of these wonderful souls that are scrolling through the screen right now. We thank every single one of you, you wonderful beings. You make this channel possible through supplying us with steady resupplies of fresh Rosamonte Suave Selezione Special Elaborata. In the words of our Japanese brethren, Kimochi Yamete. I think I might have mispronounced that. Never mind. Aside from that, hit that like button, smash that bell, just subscribe if you haven't. And since it's the spring equinox holiday, we hope that you spend it with your family, either the one you were born in or the one you chose, whichever you really feel connected to. And we'd like to add classic Polish wishes of a wet egg and merry dingus. Thank you for watching and we'll see you next time. Bye.